Welcome to the Diversity Pivot Podcast. This season, we are talking with leaders inside organizations focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. We're talking with them about best practices and proven tools for positive change. We are also sharing vignettes from our new book, Allyship in Action, to help leaders take real, tangible action on DEI right away. This work is important because all humans need to feel seen, heard, and belonging in the workplace. Welcome, y'all. We've got Nicolette Gatewood with us this week and so excited to share her story with you. Nicolette is Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Haddad and Partners. And as the first in this position, she designs efforts to further um, integrate the agency's global team by fostering an inclusive workplace environment and helping propel change in the industry. Since launching the DEI program in October of 2020, the agency has grown in its representation of people of color to nearly 40%. And that's almost doubling the percentage of black and Asian staffers and those that identify as LGBTQ plus. She leads the efforts to attract, invest in, and support diverse professionals and overseas impact work through pro bono and community projects and works to diversify the client base and design staff inclusion and engagement efforts. Wow, that's a lot. Um, And in February, Nicolette will become the executive director of BLAC Black, um, Building Leaders and Creators, an independent agency internship community with the mission of bringing more Black people into advertising and marketing, um, prepared to thrive and lead. Um, She's a professional background in cultural equity and racial justice work has worked with organizations like the Museum of African Art, the Caribbean Cultural Center, African uh, Diaspora Institute, Black Women Talk Tech, and the National Auction Network. She also has a background in Africana studies and social and cultural analysis and is a graduate of the Cornell University's DNI program. Nicolette, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Julie. As I mentioned, I've become a really big fan. So thank you. This is an honor. (laughs) It's an honor to learn about you. What a tremendous set of experiences you have. And what I love about your story is you've been able to drive real tangible action through being intentional around diversity. And that's something we, we try to educate people on, but people still don't understand like what that actually looks like in practice. So, Mm -hmm. so excited for my listeners to learn from you. Um, Tell us, kick us off with kind of your story and and how you got into this DEI work and especially around allyship. Yeah. Uh, So a a great story that is probably my favorite one to tell is actually the origin stories of a a key program we have. It's a key engagement program that we have at H&P. It's a social justice staff engagement program where we meet monthly to talk about issues in society inside and outside of our workplace that affect historically marginalized communities. Um, But the intention of the program is for us all to become better allies for these communities. So I'd like to tell you the origin story of that, um, which actually is the origin story of our DEI program at H&P. So when I came to H&P, which is about three years ago now, um, we didn't have a DEI program and I was not in this role. And um, our staff now, by the way, so we're a global creative and advertising agency. And we have employees currently in 16 plus nations around the globe. Um, what's am- and we have roughly 150 full-time employees or um, comparable contractor agreements, right? Let's say if they're international. Um, but so what's amazing about our organization is that we all ro- work remotely, of course, and we're global, um, but we're a really tight-knit community. So, um, we don't have like a lunchroom per se or an office, but we all log on to Microsoft Teams every day and we communicate and we we call ourselves a work fam. And when I first joined, I thought that was a little hokey, but I, I, I'm fully ingrained in the work fam now. And it's true. Some of the most meaningful relationships I've made um, in my professional life have been here. And these are, these are true friendships. Um, but so in the summer of 2020, our work environment looked a, a little differently. So we were a much smaller organization, I'd say, roughly one third of the size we are now. And we were global at that time though. And so I will say that even at our starting point before DEI launched, um, we were a fairly 
diverse organization just based on the global nature of our staff makeup, right? So we had, we had and still have global headquarters um, in Fairfield, Connecticut, but sizable um, communities of employees working in, in Bogota and in Lima, Peru and Australia throughout the UK. Um, so by default, we're a diverse organization, but at that time, what I knew um, just by looking, but without formal assessment at the time is that we really were lacking racial diversity specifically in the United States. And so in May, near the end of May, right, of 2020, um, all of our lives really changed um, and, and for the better, unfortunately propelled by the murder of George Floyd. Um, but immediately the nation and the world was erupting, right, with, with calls for social change and racial justice and equity and accountability and just a real call to, to change our de facto systems, which, which are racist. Um, and I noticed that um, our global community uh, at H&P, my, my work fam, was tremendously silent on this issue. So we communicate every day through teams and we, we talk about everything. We have like probably 15 plus different social channels on teams to talk about television, <laughs> current events, whatever it is that we choose to. Um, but I had noticed that nobody had said anything about what was going on in the world. Um, and to me as a person of color, and at that time I was the second black person um, working at Added and Partners as a full-time employee, that silence was roaring to me. Um, yeah, so, um, I intentionally broke the silence um, and it was interesting timing. Um, I looked back in Teams and found the message this morning. So I posted it on um, May 30th, 2020. And that, I think it was a Saturday. And that weekend we'd run a virtual 5K and we were raising money for charity. Um, and it was a great, super fun experience, but um, the fact that my nation, you know, had hit the streets and was marching um, for change um, and and evoking respect and memory and um, the sentiment that these lives, like Ahmad Aubrey's, right, um, shouldn't be shouldn't be lost in vain. So like, the irony really just wasn't lost on me, and I could no longer kind of hold my silence. Um, so I, I made a post encouraging everybody to. Number one, just, just break the silence. I quoted Martin Luther King in saying that there comes a time when your silence is betrayal. And I let them know that this in fact was one of those times. And so essentially I, I think I shared a list of resources. It was a very soft call, like please sign a petition, please donate some money, um, you know, please join a local protest. Um, and to be honest with you, I was terrified. Mm -hmm. So my, yeah, so my background, um, as, as you said, is, is really in, social justice and cultural equity work until this point, this was a career change for me. And I was about a year in, I had not mm -hmm. ever worked in advertising before or mass media. Um, I'd worked in organizations that were pri primarily um, people of color, right? That was our leadership, um, our staff makeup primarily. And our, our work was really about either cultural, cultural equity or racial justice. So this had been my life's work, um, but I, I guess I took it for granted that that would always be my environment and my surroundings. And so I found myself as one of two black people in an organization um, and demanding that people say something, right? Um, and it was a little bit scary, um, truly. But I watched the thread all night. I think I posted it at night on a Saturday and I watched the thread all night and I was, floored and truly touched by the amount of support I got That's from all cool. of my colleagues. Um, and the truth is that they didn't know what to say, but, but they had thoughts um, and they might've been active in their, their personal lives. And they didn't necessarily know how to broach the topic um, at work. And that's okay. It, it was new to all of us truly. Um, and so immediately, and I wanna give a lot of credit to one of my colleagues here. Um, at Had and Partners. Um, her name is Rachel Leak, and Rachel is a white woman and just honestly a creative powerhouse. She floors me. And she truly is one of the most brave people, not just for this, but for everything, but she's truly one of the most brave people I've ever met. And I admire her so much. 
as it relates to her unwavering commitment to social equity because she recognizes her privilege, not just in her race, um, but in her position, right? She's a very senior creative director here. Um, and she's kick-ass, we all really respect her. And so she uses that intentionally um, when she needs to. Um, and so she followed up with, I actually have it, she followed up essentially with a call to quote unquote white, white folks, right? She said, well, how are we responding? What are the ways that we need to show up and support our BIPOC colleagues and the larger communities? She says, you know, we're creative people. This is what we do for a living. Um, I'd like to see us come together as a family and brainstorm how to support and show up here. Um, so what we did um, based on the overwhelming response just to this message on Teams and um, Rachel's call to action essentially um, was we established what were at the time weekly conversations about, um, and at the time it was specifically anti-Black racism and um, the prison industrial complex, uh, the criminalization of Black men in the media and in our racial imaginaries. We looked at police brutality, white privilege, cultural appropriation. And Julie, these were truly uncomfortable conversations. They were uh, not just for me, but for everybody on the call. Um, but it was so valuable. I learned so much about my colleagues and we created a very intentional, safe place for vulnerability and for learning and unlearning. So we actually call the program Learning to Unlearn. That's the name of the program and it still exists. It's a signature program. Um, and we intentionally went into this space together as colleagues and friends um, to unlearn ingrained biases that we, that we all hold about different groups um, and nurture each other through this very uncomfortable learning process and related growing pains. Um, and it's, mm. it's been truly amazing. And in these conversations, we look at ourselves personally and professionally, and we looked at our industry and of course our organization and it launched the DEI program, which we formally launched in October of 2020. Yeah. Oh, Nicolette, what a beautiful story of one, your courage. Um, I can only imagine what it was like to post that in a silent environment. Yeah. And then to have allies, some surprise you and some really intentionally bring a call to action around these weekly conversations, tackling some pretty significantly challenging topics. Um, just a great example of how we can take tragedy and, and find a way to bring positive change out of it. Um, I'm so curious, Nicolette, about those weekly conversations you know, you, the key word I love in your story is it's intentional. And it sounds like that's an intentional, safe place where we consistently show up. Um, something I know our listeners and some of the clients we work with, they saw that, you know, those conversations, people really ready to have them the summer of 2020. Mm -hmm. And as we've waned through, you know, the pandemic or endemic, whatever we're calling it at this <laughs> point, and Zoom fatigue, meeting fatigue, um, people working more than ever. How do you keep those conversations alive? Yeah. Um, well, to be honest, we have them now monthly, um, but it's been, you know, it's a consistent program of ours and um, it's amazing. It, I think it's one of, it's one of the, the true values. Um, it's a place where we don't talk about work. Um, we can talk about work. We often talk about issues in our industry. Um, but our staff is growing and everybody is passionate about something. So something really critical to the DEI work at Had Ed and Partners that we do, which is this, so this, our, our diversity statement is essentially the guiding mission statement of everything that I lead in DEI, but it's core to um, the organization in its entirety is the expressed intention of seeing value in our employees beyond their technical expertise. So stated in our DEI mission, essentially, um, and I don't have it up and I'm not gonna paraphrase, but <laughs> well, I will paraphrase, is essentially that we see a value in, in you and who you are authentically. And now whether that is your personal identity or your lived experiences or your passions, 
that is as valuable to us as the technical skills that you bring to your job role. We know that, like I'll use myself for example, I see everything since I was a small child. I've seen everything through the lens of a black woman. I'm not going to write you copy for you know your internet company or whatever the client might be, right? I, I cannot write that through a lens that it's not as a black woman. Everything I do and the way that I see everything and the way that I'm treated, the way that I navigate this world is as a black woman. And I know that that is true for everybody's identities. Um, so we value that. We don't ask you to check it at the door. We actually encourage you to bring it into your work because we think it makes your work better. And we think it makes our organization internally a much better place and all of the work we produce for our clients much better. Um, so that really is key to our company culture and learning to unlearn is one of the ways that we explore these issues relevant um, to, to our colleagues. So it's largely a volunteer basis. Um, and there's, we always have a, you know, a backlist. Like we, we plan a number of months out because people are always reaching out like, and they'd say, I'd really like to talk about something like, um, let's say, um, minority populations in international prison systems, or I'd really like to look at um, queer baiting in television shows, or, you know, people bring in so many different topics and we have these really fascinating conversations. And we bring in guest speakers um, a lot. Like we recently did a really, really valuable um, presentation from just a friend of the agency who's a woman who's legally blind and really passionate about ADA compliance beyond baseline accessibility. I mean, so she spoke to us using her personal experiences and it changed the way we look at things. We, des we design websites, right, for, for many of our clients and we certainly follow um, accessibility standards and everything we do is ADA compliant, but understanding it from a user perspective was just so valuable. Um, so, I mean, these things make us better people and they make us a better agency and yeah, we, yeah. we don't, it is, it's always very, very well attended. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. I mean, those are some really significant topics. I can imagine how that would garner interest. It's not just staying safe with, uh, the usual topics. It's really digging into some, some really, um, challenging ones. Absolutely. I, I'm I'm curious, Nicolette, knowing what you know about the media and being in the agency world and your new work that you're embarking on, you know, representation really does matter. And I, I love what you said about I'm a black woman. Like that's always going to be like my identity because mm -hmm. it's so important that we bring our full identities to work, but it's hard when we don't see ourselves reflected in the world around us, whether that's media, advertising, you know, the world that you're in, I know is just very male dominated, but very white dominated, mm -hmm. and of course, straight, you know, abilities, uh, all those fold into the majority group. I'm curious, like from your vantage point, what, what needs to be done to help diversify our media more? Yeah. I mean, so there's really, there's two angles to this. And of course they're very related. One is representation within the industry, like within job roles, right? Leadership, um, job positions, right? Within the industry. And then the other of course is the media that we, we all know just as Americans or global citizens, it's the media that we see. Um, so the two certainly need to progress in tandem. Um, if you wanna look at representation in the media for, um, a minute though, I'd love to talk about that because sure. something we just started rolling out um, to all of our clients. So internally, we have a commitment to increasing representation within all of the work that we're putting into market. Um, but what we learned recently is that um, we need to start having these intentional <laughs> conversations, these proactive and progressive. Um, they have not yet been uncomfortable, but I could see how they, how they might become. But we are now intentionally having these conversations with our clients um, about the work that we're producing with them and on their behalf to put into market. And so while we have our own internal standards <clears throat> for adequate representation of, of all groups, um, we're often limited, of course, by, by briefs, you know, by our bosses, right? <laughs> our clients. Um, so by, by briefs or let's say um, asset libraries that their brand has to approve and that's 
where our designers, you know, receive stock photographs or illustrations, um, et cetera. So we've started rolling out a training to all of our clients on inclusive representation and advertising. And so what this is, is um, an intentional conversation um, to broaden everybody's understanding of diversity and what that looks like adequately and respectful communication and visual representation. Um, so I think a lot of people, of course, think racial diversity is, is kind of the extent of their responsibility. Mm -hmm. and, and that's just not true. Um, it is true that a, a lot of attention should be paid to racial diversity, but just as much attention and intention, right? If this is our word today, should be paid to LGBTQ plus representation, gender diversity, which is inclusive of trans and non-binary communities, just as much um, attention and intention needs to be placed on representing uh, people with disabilities and representing generational diversity and promoting body positivity and showing models of all different sizes. We need to, of course, incorporate religious difference, not show families in the same very multi-dimensional view that we have traditionally understand them. You know, families, including my own, are interracial. Um, uh, you know, some are same sex, uh, you know, families look all, all, all different ways these days. Um, and so we're really trying to broaden every, our partners, right? So we're really trying, it's an intentional attempt to broaden everyone's understanding of diversity and convey to them how critically important it is societally and why. So when it comes to, um, expansive gender inclusion, essentially, um, it is estimated that one quarter, 25% of Gen Zers anticipate changing their gender identity at least once in their lifetime. That's powerful. So this is truly, it's amazing. It is amazing. It is clearly the social justice issue of our generation, right? Um, and things are changing every day. They're changing very rapidly and they're changing very quickly. And, you know, within the past handful of years, we've come to understand that things that we accepted as truth, like a, a binary gender norm, are just not factual. Um, and we all have to adjust here. So something we're working with our clients on is removing uh, gendered pronouns from most of their language, for example, right? Can we replace it with they, them? Um, and it's critical not just for this social justice imperative, but for their bottom line, right? So if one quarter of Gen Z, the rest of us are all now more socially conscious and will make spending decisions based on brand values. We want to see our peers ad adequately represented and respected um, just as much as we do ourselves. So it's really critical for business in addition to that. But I do want to circle back to the social justice imperative because our industry has the power to change buying habits. So Absolutely. Um, if you can sell someone 20 different types of toothpaste, and you know, I, I have a ton in my cabinet, so clearly I'm very susceptible to this. But if you can change somebody's buying habits, you can certainly change the sentiments they hold in their minds and in their hearts. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, advertising, especially as a feeling based business, you know, people mm -hmm. don't buy a can of Coke because they think it tastes good. I mean, in their mind, they might think that, but it's the feeling it's the red can, you know, it's the emotion, mm -hmm. the connection. And yeah, I mean, media and advertising has such an important role in shaping and shifting our perceptions, whether that's gender fluidity or like you said, LGBTQ plus representation or those with disabilities and racial diversity, because so often the images that we're surrounded by, especially as young people, remember growing up and just seeing it so normalized, you know, a thin, blonde, white girl, blue eyes I too, you know, like that was the beauty image. Like that's very tall, I tried. very thin. We yep. did not question it. Mm -mm. That's what I thought I was supposed to look like. And, you know, I am white and did have blonde hair and blue eyes. So, and it was tall and skinny. So I guess I did try <laughs> just luckily fit into that norm. Now I also had braces, acne and scoliosis, but that's a whole nother issue. <laughs> but, you know, if you don't see yourself reflected, it's, it's really painful as a human being. And I don't think people 
that ads are designed for where you're just naturally reflected. I don't think people even think about it, right? Because it's like so normal for them. Like it was for me to be like, yeah, it's all like me. You know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I see me all the time. So I wouldn't even think about somebody that looks at that and is like, nope, not for me. Well, you know, the saddest part about that is that I felt the same as you. I, I, I'm not mm. blonde. I'm, I'm not white. Um, but I did accept that to be true. This is how I grew up. This is how generations before me grew up. But we didn't, we rarely saw ourselves um, in these types of representations. So mm. it is amazing to me um, how quickly things have changed. I'm not saying that we're there yet. We're not. Right. This is certainly a journey. Um, but we've seen a lot of things change. It wasn't that long ago. I think it was 20. No, I was in grad school. It might've been 2011 um, where Cheerios uh, put out a commercial representing um, a biracial little girl who looked just like me. Mm -hmm. And just like me, she had a black parent and a white parent. And Mm -hmm. she was having a a lovely morning with her parents eating her Cheerios and the backlash they received from consumers like this threat on family values and you know I was so offended that so many people were offended by my very existence Mm. this is just a decade ago yeah yeah I remember that ad too and I remember not really even thinking anything of it you know being ignorant Mm -hmm. to the, the real issue at hand but I remember that backlash too and it just it it feels I think it feels like we've come so far and then you remember mm-hmm. how far we have to go still because there's still people that feel that way. They may be not there as public about it, but yeah. they certainly still feel that way. I, I wonder, Nicolette, from your vantage point, making the shift in your career right now, being so deeply connected to DEI work, what are the challenges we really need to face and in, in, in to make diversity work long-term? Yeah, I think um, this is something I'm, I'm sure you've said ad nauseum, but I will say it one more time. Um, <laughs> DEI responsibilities cannot lie within a DEI office or a DEI department, or as is the case in so, so many organizations, all DEI responsibilities cannot fall on the shoulders of one staffer. Um, this is often tremendously exhaustive and emotional work specifically for one staffer. Um, But I will also say that it cannot be successful unless it's woven into every fiber of an organization's being. And I mean, this starts from the moment you might encounter, let's say a new staffer, right? So the language of your job post, is it sexist? (laughs) Is it inherently racist? Is it gendered, right? We really need to look at that and be intentional. Um, it, it, it needs to be woven into your interview questions. It needs to be woven into conversations around pay equity and investments and employees and their success. It needs to obviously be woven into your review of internal policies, practices, and procedures. And as I was just talking about, I, I think it needs to also be adequately woven into what it is that you are producing, right? So if you're a a for-profit business, what what is it that you create? So from the vantage point of a creative agency and advertising agency, we produce assets that go into the market and we see that we have a responsibility related to DEI there. So it really needs to be woven into everything from top to bottom. I will also say that it's no longer adequate for an organization to just have a commitment to diversity. I think um, we need to see all organizations and specifically large corporations make a commitment to actively being anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-homophobic, anti-heteronormative, anti-cis normative, right? Anti-ableist, anti-ageist. We need to actively break down these systems that were default, like by default created to uphold societal standards um, that only benefit certain groups. And so we just have to recognize that 
every smaller institution exists as a as a replica like we are microcosms of the society we live in so by default mm -hmm. your organization probably is racist and ageist and ableist that that is the society we live in yep. so if we take the approach that we actively need to break that um i think we'll all be a lot more successful in changing not just our organizations but society right if we're all putting in this work um and it's something i hear you know often i'm sure you've encountered it many many times is um, when it comes to organizations reaching their diversity goals, we often hear the excuse that, you know, we can't find talent. We're really looking and we're adequately looking, but, you know, we can't find talent. So I would like to really challenge all organizations of, of all sizes, um, certainly major corporations <laughs> with major dollars, but um, smaller organizations as well, that if you believe this to be true, then what it is, what is it that you're doing to actively change the next generation of industry talent. So Haddad and Partners in the summer of 2020 launched a graphic design program um, aimed at students of color uh, living, at, living in cities. So we piloted the program in a, a city in Connecticut called Bridgeport, which is home to some of the highest uh, national rates of socioeconomic diversity, um, racial diversity, cultural diversity. Um, and it's also in, essentially the backyard of our global headquarters. So we, Fairfields, Connecticut and Bridgeport reside in the same county. Um, so within, we are at our core, um, a creative agency and we were founded by DJ Haddad, who's a graphic designer and animator. And you might actually recognize his work, um, his claim to fame, though he doesn't promote it much, I do, <laughs> um, was back in the day, he actually designed the orange, the animated orange bouncing ball for ING. I don't know if you remember oh, that yeah, commercial. yeah, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so that was DJ, yeah, when he was younger. Um, and he founded H&P. Um, but he, his love has always been the arts and graphic design. Um, but we know that there are certain accessibility barriers that have created a graphic design industry that does not reflect the demographics of our nation, right? So in the United States, those employed within graphic design positions, only 3% of them are African-American and only 8% of them identify as Latino or Hispanic. So we launched a program, yeah, it's absurd. And there are a number of reasons why. Um, you know, a lot of it, of course, is systemic racism, but this breeds into accessibility barriers that make these things more complicated. So we designed Summer Studio in an attempt to address those accessibility barriers and provide opportunity um, to young talented students before they even enter college or think about art school or think about graphic design as a major, we're aiming to intervene and introduce talented creatives to the field of graphic design. And um, it's amazing. We launched it last summer and we'll be expanding it this coming summer. And um, I know DJ hopes to grow it nationally in the future. Um, but all students, um, I'll tell you about last summer. So we piloted it with 10 students. All of them were from Bridgeport. 100% of them identified as black, Latino or indigenous. 100% um, of them graduated, which is truly amazing because they went through a four week intensive university level graphic design curriculum. And oh, they learned, cool. and it was amazing. They actually did it at Sacred Heart University and they learned graphic design, Photoshop, photo editing, animation, stop motion. Um, and then they left the program with um, a full portfolio. So the basis that they need to um, apply to graphic design programs in college if they choose to. Um, but also, also with the experience of presenting their work, um, we did an exhibition, we did a graduation ceremony and they had to present their portfolios. Um, and they all graduated, they left the program, 100% of them reported, of course, increased knowledge in all of the programs that we taught. But more importantly, all of them reported increased confidence in their skill set, in their abilities, in their presentation skills. Um, and they all left with a portfolio and they left, they were all gifted a, a personal laptop and a year's subscription to Adobe because it's expensive, but this is it their, is. their tool. Mm -hmm. This is their tool and they need it. That's cool. What I love yeah. about that story is sometimes we say things and, and this really peeves me off. Um, not only can we not find diverse talent, which is annoying, 
Um, but then there's the other, it's like, oh, we can't lower the standards, you know, like, are these kids going to be able to like figure it out? And what I love about your story is yes, you can find them. And (laughs) when they're trained, just like anyone else would be and have access to the same tools and information, of course, they're going to thrive just like others. And Yep. To think that somebody's somehow not capable because of the color of their skin or where they're from just seems so absurd to me. But we have this, like you said, this baked in uh, racism and sexism and homophobia just in, we're swimming in the waters of it, right? As mm-hmm. a, you can't escape it. Um, it's everywhere. It's baked into all of our systems. And so we really need intentional approaches like this to solve the problem. And, and the other thing I'm taking away from this conversation, Nicolette, is the importance for us to all be involved. Um, you know, it's an interesting time where I think a lot of folks still think like, this isn't the conversation for me, right? Silence is the best option, which of course, with your opening story is so hurtful to people. Mm-hmm. Um, by staying silent, you're, you're kind of just accepting the status quo because the status quo probably works for you. Um, just so yeah. unfortunate that you know it doesn't work yeah. for other people. So you probably care because they're human beings. <laughs> That's right. a whole other thing. Right. Um, Nicola, and thanks so much for these wisdom, great stories and tools and examples of how to take real action as an ally. Um, as we're wrapping up, I'd love to know you're moving on to a new yeah. venture. Um, I'd love to know more about that and especially how our listeners can connect with you. Yeah. So today is actually um, my last day as an employee of Had Ed and Partners. Um, It truly, by the way, has been the highlight of my professional career um, to date. Um, So it's a really bittersweet moment for me, but I will continue to work with H&P in a couple of ways um, because I'm I'm really, really proud of the impact we've made, Um, not just organizationally, but, you know, in our communities with programs like Summer Studio or Internship Program or volunteerism efforts or pro bono work. Like I'm, I'm truly very proud of the things that we've done um, at this agency. Um, but I am moving on to a, a new position that I'm just as proud of and excited about. Um, so it, at the end of this month, after a couple of weeks off, <laughs> um, I'll be starting a new position as the first executive director of a nonprofit called BLAC, as you mentioned, which is an acronym for building leaders and creators. Um, And BLAC has the intention of placing more black talent into advertising positions prepared to thrive and grow and and lead very soon. Um, So the nonprofit was started, it was founded by a consortium of independent ad agencies, much like Had Ed and Partners, who came together um, after the death of George Floyd with the intention of promoting black talent um, and being um, essentially like a a guiding force and um, an an asset um, to help the industry by and large further further integrate racially. Um, So African-Americans are largely, largely underrepresented in advertising. There's a stat and I don't think it's that old now but I do hope it's changed. But those in client facing positions in advertising. Um, So the racial demographic of, I'm sorry, the racial representation of of those in client facing positions in the industry and not too long ago, who identified as African-American was less than 1%. This is astonishing because if we look at the media and you know, I I do have a background in in black studies, like this has always been my passion since, since I was a kid. But even since I was a kid, black culture has really dominated global culture and um, our cultural contributions are co-opted so often by corporations. Once I understood um, the fact that the advertising industry, for example, um, employees report 40% more instances of racial discrimination within advertising than they do within the larger US labor market. Um, And I just, the underrepresentation is is just a tremendous problem. There's been so much activism in the past year plus after the death of George Floyd and and so many advocacy, professional advocacy organizations doing so much great work. Um, There's really not 
much that the industry can do at this moment other than change. But of course, we're still going to hear things like, well, where did we find this town, right? So um, BLAC is um, a place that you can start. Um, it's not gonna be your, your end all definitive um, solve to your DEI problem, um, but is our intention to place um, young black talent within advertising agencies. So how this works is, um, at the moment, the signature program of BLAC is an internship program. So they launched it last year for the first time and we'll be doing it again this summer. And we have 20 committed agency partners and we'll be placing between 40 and 60 um, interns among them and, and nationally. Um, and so they apply to BLAC, we vet them for you. We get some really incredible creatives. Um, we vet them for you and, and we place them with you and, and we train them. Um, so when they come into your agencies, they're really prepared um, to thrive and, and learn with you. Um, but we support the agencies as well, because just as critical as it is for the for the interns to be trained in the profession, you know, your agency, if this is, you know, your first kind of intentional step into diversity, um, you need to be trained as well. So we put them all through trainings um, to ensure, and we support them as a network, right? But to ensure that Black talent there is um, seen and heard and respected, and they feel that they can bring their authentic selves and voices and perspectives into their new job role. Um, and I will say that last year, the program was a resounding success. And at the end of the internship, session, they were able to place over 70% of their intern class into full-time mm. employment and advertising. That's cool. And so we're yeah. really excited. I think leveling the playing field up front, right, early on and getting folks trained up. I mean, that's such a powerful story of once we create, a, I mean, we're never going to create a fully equal level playing field, but once we level out some of the circumstances and a lot of the gaps is just at access to education is still such a huge problem and access to knowledge. Advertising is a closed door industry. Yeah. I, and, and so many other industries are like this, but by and large, and there have been studies and reports on this when it comes to opportunity and things like internship programs, specifically with advertising, this is, ref this is nepotism. These are referrals. Mm -hmm. So you are allowed in the door if you know somebody or you're somebody's nephew or niece. And um, this is just an industry problem. So, and advertising truly, most agencies I know, they run on a referral. They fuel themselves. They staff themselves largely on a referral basis. So if your organization is predominantly white, it will, you will continue to refer like people, that's just the nature of being a human being. Mm -hmm. So until you intentionally break that, it's only going to grow you more of the same. Yep. Yeah. But what you're creating is that with BLAC is that once you get to know a graduate, right, of the program, mm -hmm. then you're more familiar with that. And so the next graduate, you're more like, oh, okay, yeah, like it's less of a risk or, you know, perceived risk because you're more comfortable. So it's just, it helps solve that pipeline problem. That's so, such a great story. I'm so excited for you and your next chapter and really enjoyed having you on the podcast. Thanks so much for sharing your story, Nicolette. And thank you. This has been great. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. Allies are necessary for positive change. If you are on the journey to becoming an ally, we invite you to participate in our brand new Lead Like an Ally online program or get a copy of our new book, Allyship in Action, available on Amazon. Both are helpful tools that meet leaders where they're at and help provide tools for professional and personal settings. Head over to nextpivotpoint.com to get started today.